Okay. We are part of a historical revolution. When I was born, there wasn't a single country in the world where it wasn't legal to hit children. In 79, Sweden became the first country to legalize corporal abuse uh, of children, corporal punishment of children, and since then, 50 more countries have joined them. 25 years ago, there was still not a place in the world where a same-sex couple could get married. Now, there are 25 countries like that. And in fact, these changes are very recent, and not only that, they're unprecedented in history. They're unprecedented in other societies. This is new, it's rapid, it's moving fast. When the first Star Wars movie came out, the last person to be killed by a guillotine in France had yet not died. Today, half of the world's countries have abolished death penalty. So, we like often to talk about values as things in space. There are Swedish values, and there are Middle Eastern values, and there are American values. But we often forgot, forget to think about the time aspect. These things that we think of, for instance, as Swedish values, they were not our values a hundred years ago. Where did they come from, and why are they spreading? This is what I'm going to try and tell you today. Our values, we can think of as something on the top of us. Below them are some moral foundations. So what are moral foundations? Moral foundations are, I like to think of them as the answer to the question, why is that good or why is that bad? Um, I have a six-year-old at home, so I get a lot of questions. And he asks me, why can I do that, why can't I do that? So if he says, why can't I hit people? I say, because you harm them. And then when he says, why is it wrong to harm people? I have no answer to that question. That's because for me, not harming others is a moral foundation. That's just wrong by itself. The same thing goes for encroaching on others' liberty. The same thing goes for doing so that things become unfair. And in the return, it's a moral good to make things fair. There are also other moral foundations. Uh, obeying authority, keeping loyalty with your in-group, and staying pure to a higher sense of yourself or uh, according to your religion. These moral foundations underpin a huge set of moral values or moral opinions, ranging from gay marriage that we talked about already, to stem cell research, to violence, to free speech, civil rights, abortion, huge set of questions. All of them founded on different arguments about right and wrong. Why should gay people be allowed to marry? Because it's unfair if they're not. Why should they not be allowed to marry? Because it goes against our tradition. It goes against my religion. These are all the type of arguments that we use to convince others of one of these positions on these moral questions. But we're here to talk about how things changed, and we're here to talk about ripple effects. And I like to think about this as the largest ripple in history, the largest stone thrown into our history so far, the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, throughout history, the GDP per capita, that's how we measure like, how much we produce per person, was pretty stable. There were inventions, there were new technologies say in, pharma, in agriculture and so on, and it increased production a little. But we soon get enough children to cover that increase in production, and then we're back to the same stable GDP per capita. Up until the Industrial Revolution, when we turned machines into doing work for us, we were suddenly able to produce an overflow, a massive overflow. Now, in the beginning, most of that overflow went into the pockets of the people who owned those industries. 
who own those machines. But as labor, labor become more specialized, and as labor unions started making more demands, this value spread throughout society and created societies that we can call prosperous. Prosperous meaning here that all citizens have food, shelter, and so on, that the, the things that you need to sustain your life are already covered. They are guaranteed by society. Now, when things like that are guaranteed by society, something happens to your, to your root moral foundation, something happens to your moral psychology. These are my grandparents. They grew up in a poor Sweden, and they were poor. They had food, but they never knew if they were going to eat enough to really, feel full, to really be filled in the evening. They didn't know if the future would have wars, hardship, and so on, or if the future would keep being sustaining them alive. So they grew up with a fear inside of them. And this led them to, to value stability, to value keeping things safe, to value traditions that kept things the same way that they were. The little girl on the left, that's my mother. She didn't grow up that way. She grew up this way. She grew up in a middle-class family in Sweden, which, which my grandfather and grandmother had attained. She grew up with a basket full of goodies that at any time she could pick out from. So even though both her parents who tried to teach her their values, tried to teach her traditional values, she was not susceptible to that. Because she was not afraid. She was ready to explore adventure. She was ready to self-express, not get a stable job, but a job that felt meaningful. So when my grandparents wanted her to become a kindergarten teacher and date a doctor, she turned that on its head, moved across country to do this. Now, what did she do? So this is the little girl as she grew up, my mother. She's building a warehouse. This warehouse, her and her new friends from all over the globe, are going to fill with clothing, clothing that's been donated to them. They're going to sell that clothing to people, and they're going to use that money uh, to support liberation armies in southern Africa. And there are many things to say about doing this, but one thing you can say is that this is not a stable profession. <laughs> this is not the say, choice of someone who's seeking security. This is a choice of someone who values meaning and self-expression. So what had happened to my mother? We go back to these moral foundations. She had shifted. The three on the top, she ca still cared about those. She cared about caring for others, not harming others. Liberty. She cared about justice and fairness. But the ones on the bottom, the ones about authority, tradition, loyalty, purity, those were not valuable to her anymore. Those were not, no longer the core root answers to what is moral and what is non-moral. And this, this fact that some things are no longer arguments for you, no longer functional moral arguments, has a huge impact on how our opinions and values change. Specifically, these modernist people who only care about some moral foundations, they don't listen to all arguments anymore. They don't move their opinion when someone says, we have to do this for the honor of our country. They say, that's not an argument to me. Or when someone says, if you don't do this, you're not valuing your own people. They say, that's not an argument to me. And as those arguments go away, two things happen. The first is that the people, the, if you look at the questions, the first thing that happens is that if one side of the question is supported only by arguments that these modernists don't listen to, they start to move in the other direction. If all arguments against gay marriage is based on tradition, is based on religion, then these modernists will move away from that. 
to which argument they listen to about fairness and harm. But not only that, because when they start to move, the other people, the traditionalists, the ones who still value all moral foundations, they listen to all arguments. And as the modernists are moving in one direction, they're also out there spreading their arguments. So the traditionalists start to move after, not because those arguments are more convincing, but because they become more common in the population. So for gay marriage, which is one of the clear cases of this, the arguments on one side is no longer listened to by the modernists, but they think it's unfair that some people are not allowed to marry the person they love, and therefore they are against banning gay marriage, therefore legalizing it and having same-state status. And then the other people, who still think that we should care about our traditional way, they start hearing this message over and over, that it's unfair, it's unfair. And they care about fairness, so they also start to move. And this is exactly what we see. So the data here is from the US. But this is a global trend. I'll show some data on that as well. What we see here is on the x-axis, there's time. So the data starts in uh, the late 70s. Uh, and on the y-axis, it's percentage of the population who think that um, homosexuality is acceptable. Uh, it's not about legalizing gay marriage, because that question wasn't asked back then, but about whether or not it's acceptable. And the blue line are liberals. And liberals, in this context, is the same as modernists. These are the people who only value some moral foundations. You can see how they start moving up there. But then, not long after, the red line, the conservatives, the people who still believe in traditional moral foundations, they're also moving up. Now, if you look at other questions, such as the one about abortion, this is not true. With abortion, the arguments on the one side is about um, the freedom of the woman who is pregnant to deal with her life. It's about the harm that's caused to her if she has to have this unwanted child. But on the other side, the argument about the harm to the unborn. And these are arguments that everyone still listens to. So here, the shift doesn't happen in the same sense. Rather, it stays flat. It's still a very vital issue in the US. And in Sweden, we like to think that we're kind of done with the debate, but we don't have free abortions. We settled on a compromise where it's free up until a certain amount of weeks, and after that, you have to have a medical exam that allows you to do it, and after that, you're still banned. It's not free abortion up until you have the baby. So for some questions, we see movement. And when we see movement, the modernists start, and the traditionists follow. And for other questions, it stays flat. And you don't have to take my word for it. We went out and measured it. So what we did is we asked a large group of people about what arguments support a certain position. If someone takes their own life, because they have a disease. Does that harm someone? Is it unfair to someone? Does it encroach on someone's liberty? Is it against authority or traditional values? Uh, is it illoyal? Is it against religion or some other sense of purity? So we ask this for a whole set of questions. And what we come out with then is that we can measure the difference in arguments in favor and the arguments against a specific moral position. From this measurement, we can look at to what extent are these arguments that everyone listened to overrepresented on one side compared to the other. We call this the advantage of that position, of that uh, moral value. And what we find is the moral opinions with most universal arguments win. What does win mean? It means that they are the ones that spread. So up on the same layer, you have same-sex marriage. On the x-axis, you have how much advantage is. So pro-same-sex marriage has lots of advantage. And on the y-axis, you see how much the public opinion has changed during the last 50 years. So it's changed a lot in exactly that direction. 
on the lower uh, side there, you have the questions for which advantage for modernist arguments are in the other direction. And as you see, those are ones where the public opinion has moved in the other direction. And in the middle, you have the things where there's no real difference in advantage, and there's no real movement, such as abortion. Okay, this means that if we take all of these issues, all of the 74 issues before, and we combine them into one graph that tells us about how all our values are moving, what we see is that these values that the liberals start with, they're the ones winning. They're winning among liberals, and they're winning among conservatives. The last 40 years, there's a constant stride. Every time the modernist or liberal side comes up with a new issue, such as, should transsexuals have the same bathrooms as non-transsexuals? It starts off as a small issue, it starts with few people supporting it, and then first the modernists start supporting it, and then we'll see the traditionals coming after. This is true not in the US only. So this is global data from 66 countries from the World Value Survey. Here, the modernists are called non-authoritarian, that is, they don't, they don't rely on authority, they don't think authority is a good thing. And uh, the traditionalists think authority is a good thing. You see the same thing. Now, I want to point out that the opinion here doesn't go very high up yet. In a global sense, acceptance of homosexuality is still low. But as you see by the direction of the lines, our clearest prediction is that it's getting better much, much faster than they ever thought possible. And not just among the people who have certain core values, but the other ones are following right behind. And remember, 1989, slightly more than 25 years ago, not even marriage, but same-sex partnership became legal for the first time in Denmark. Before that, nowhere in the world was it legal. So this is a very, very rapid change in opinion, even though most people in Sweden today think that it's obvious that people of the same sex should be able to marry each other. And this all started with ensuring that people had food, had health, had a place to live, could feel safe about their future. 